a good day to the listening and the viewers, the listeners and viewers uh, who are tuned in to the Guyanese Critic. I have here with me the Minister of uh, Culture, Youth and Sport and after the recent budget, the Ministry of Culture, Youth and Sport has been given almost four billion dollars. Um, that's four with nine zeros behind it, right? We're gonna talk to the minister and try to figure out where, when, and what will that money be spent on. Minister, thank you for having us. And don't look like a four with, with, with nine zeros behind it, smile. <laughs> it's nine zeros, but I remember the last time that we had an interview was at the Marriott just before the election. Um, and, you know, we, I was very pleased to be able to do our first interview with the realest thing out of GT. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so getting right into it, um, where, when, and what will this almost $4 billion be spent on? First of all, it's important that the public knows that this is the largest budget um, in the country, in the country's history, but it's also the largest budget for the Ministry of Culture and Sport in the country's history. As you know, in the last administration, the Ministry of Culture and Sport was disbanded. Um, it was relegated to a department within ministries, um, and young people had lost their voice. They were neglected, they broken promises, and that's why it was important, um, having had our first budget, um, first real budget, that a lot of, that first of all, there was gonna be an increased allocation, and how it's going to be used, and how it's going to be used differently. So today, for example, uh, just immediately after this interview, I have a meeting with the, the managers for the culture department, for us to be able to redefine, redesign, and redefine uh, how we're going to be allocating the money that was given to us through our budget so that it reaches as many people as possible as well as it impacts as many people as possible. In addition to that, that it reflects the Guyanese culture, the Guyanese community and its diversity. Um, that part is important for, for the ministry because we want to make sure that all Guyanese feel represented in the way that we're doing our things. That's why a lot of our events have been so successful so far. We've been doing all of our events virtually, which is because of, a, of the COVID pandemic, but we had to do it in an innovative way. And a lot of how we were doing our events coming out of the, the last budget was uh, different in the sense that it reflected all Guyanese. Now, what are some of the major things that you're gonna see coming out of, out of our budget uh, for the various sector? So first of all, let's look at the ministry itself, okay? I brought back over to the ministry the youth department. The youth department was first in, uh, in the middle street, it's a building there that the ministry has. They were in Middle Street, and over the last few months, it was difficult for us to get a good assessment with them being so far away and not being able to connect to us in a very deep way so that we're, we're instilling that culture, that, that sense of high performance that we've been trying to do in the various departments for the ministry. So we brought them over. Um, We've already started to say, to say to them how we are going to refashion our youth program. The youth program has about a billion dollars in it. We have in there, and I want everybody to understand as well, that how important youth is as part of a government policy is that it stretches across ev almost every sector, every important sector of the government. So. And it really came out of identified issues that young people face or young professionals face, etc. Education, training, entrepreneurship and business, 
housing, scholarships, talent development, all of those are and experiences, all of those and jobs, right? All of those were identified issues that from a policy perspective, uh, the government knew that it had to tackle in a very multifaceted way. So for example, Beyond the Ministry of Culture and Sport, which is what I'm, I'm going to explain in a second, you have the government a commitment where we are going to be um, uh, giving out 20,000 scholarships, right? 5,000 a year, there was an increased allocation of over a billion dollars for this year from the Ministry of Public Service. Um, then on housing, 50,000 house lots within the, the five-year period. You've seen the increased allocation that matches the intention to do so. Uh, entrepreneurship grants for small businesses. So that's coming from the Ministry of, of Industry, Tourism Industry and Commerce. There's a small business development fund. We also made the amendment in the, in the legislation, um, the Small Business Act, uh, just a few months ago, or a few weeks ago, where 20% of uh, small businesses are going to be the, the priority for government works. Um, on uh, jobs, you'll see a lot of our uh, infrastructural projects and private investment that is going to generate a lot of the jobs coming now. Training. On the education side, it's one of the largest budgets ever. Um, probably the largest in the country's history for education, but that covers tertiary, so secondary, tertiary, as well as uh, the tech box. There are 12 tech box under the Ministry of um, Education. And then on our ministry, we also, on the youth side, we also have three training institutions. The Sapphire Training Center, Fireman's Irving in New Amsterdam, and the Kuru Kuru Training College. We have two more that are in the pipeline, one in Den Amstel and one in, in Kualdegem. But I'm now reprogramming the work that's being done there and modernizing those facilities, first of all, because when I went to visit those facilities, they, they looked as though they were out of a different era. The, the condition is not in a bad state. So all of our capital work is going into immediately um, revamping and modernizing and getting those facilities up to a very good standard so that when young people pass through there, they have a very good experience, first of all. Um, in addition, uh, for those programs that they have there, we're redesigning the program now uh, over the next few days so that it matches the demands for the coming change of the labor market. So a lot of it is going to be geared towards the construction industry. So your uh, electrician, your plumbing, your mason, your welding, uh, those areas, carpentry, those areas where there's going to be a high demand as a result of this uh, impending construction boom that we're going to be uh, going into immediately. Um, so that's on, on the training side. On the entrepreneurship side, we also have uh, about $90 million in grants for small and innovative businesses for young people. And we're tying that in with a Shark Tank event, which is intended to imbue a sense of entrepreneurship amongst young people. Let them explore and test their young innovative ideas and fresh ideas and then say to them, if you are qualified as a result of passing through this, this process, we'll give you a, a grant at the end of it. And we don't just leave them alone. We're also going to go through training with them. We're going to go through uh, monitoring and evaluation. So the money is there as well for entrepreneurship. And then on the culture, youth, uh, the culture and sports side, all of those are intended to target young people as well. So it's not only about training and education, but it's also about their talent development. Because young people also want to be able to explore their, their dreams and their, their talents in, 
areas in artistic areas and, and sporting areas. You've seen uh, how aggressively we've been driving a lot of the sport side. But on the talent side, people don't get a full sense of what we're doing as well because a lot of people are very passionate about sport and it, sport just kind of stretches across the country. On the culture side, there's also going to be uh, uh, an increased allocation of about $30 million or so for grants and training. Um, but we're also spending quite a bit of money on our facilities. So the cultural center, for example, we want to redo all the seats, the, the lighting and the, and the sound, some the museums, etc. We want to bring those facilities where they have a better experience when people come and do their exhibitions and, and, and go through those, um, those museums. But in particular, we have a, a very special project that's ongoing at Castellani. So the, the intention for Castellani is that it's a very modern, very nice and appealing uh, exhibition space so that the visual artists get a chance to be able to exhibit their, their, their crafts in this space where the public can go and see it and feel good about their experience while they're there. We had to do a lot of work that's already started and then we're turning the outside space in Castellani, which is where we're going to be the outside space into a, a nice, um, with gazebos and walkways and fountains, etc., so that visual artists can come there and set up their um, easels and they can have a good, safe space for them to go and advance their, their talents. Minister, just before you, you, you go further, let me stop you there. And you said Castellani House is where Burnham used to live. I would suppose that at this time there would be remnants of um, uh, maybe works of art and so on that would be in remembrance of Burnham. Um, to be fair to culture, those works of art and uh, whatever is there that came from a past era will be preserved Absolutely. for Guyana's future. Absolutely. Part of our, part of our culture budget, which also is tapped on to the, the, the Guyana National Trust. So we've given, I think, about $130 million to the Guyana National Trust, for which falls under their care um, a lot of the historical sites, the monuments, etc. So a lot of the capital works that's going through culture will be happening through the National Trust, but we had to give them the money to do it too. But they had to also submit some of the, the, the proposals in order for us to vet it when we go through um, the budget submissions. So you'll see a lot of the enhancement work for the museum, sorry, not the museums, the historical sites, the monuments, etc. In even some places on the islands, um, a lot of work is going to be going on there as well for preservation. Um, but the artwork, absolutely. We're, we are making sure that they, those pieces are stored um, and stored safely. On the sports side, we didn't get to finish on the sports side. Um, but, oh, we, there's one other thing that we're also going to work, be working on. We want to work on an online market for those craftsmen, meaning the artists, so that they can get their products overseas. In the Caribbean islands, in the diaspora in the United States, in Canada, in the UK. Right now we're working out the, the, the design as well as the logistics to know that when somebody makes a payment here, First of all, the artists are able to receive their money, but that the persons who make the payments, they can get their their product in a short space of time. Um, because people wouldn't trust the market if it's not they're not getting their goods. So that is for them to get foreign currency uh, for their artistry and their craft. Why is that important? It's because it incentivizes them to continue doing their craft. If they don't have the sales, then they're just doing this for the love of it. Now, love is very important, but it's not important without money. You know, there was an old saying, um, without money, no, no money, no love. So we're looking at an online market to get those craftsmen to have their products uh, shipped overseas, exported overseas. And moving forward, Minister, um, just before we move on, I want to bring clarity to what was said. A lot is, you just said a lot. And really it encaptures the fact that your 
ministry has allocated one billion dollars for youth. Almost one billion. Almost one billion dollars. Now, on the culture side, it was it's one point one billion. That is not limited to your ministry. Your government, across different ministries, are forging forward with youth development. So it's not limited. What youth can expect in Guyana for the next year is not just what the, the Ministry of Culture, Youth, and Sport has to offer, but the Ministry of Business, um, Agriculture might be doing things. There are a number of ministries that are looking at youth development. Absolutely, and that's because you've got a young cabinet, right? The cabinet is young. The president is young. The president is only about 41 years old, so he just left that period where they're categorized by the United Nations as what is a youth, meaning up to 35, so 16 to 35. So in terms of getting a full appreciation of an understanding of young people, most of the cabinet members, they fully understand are in tune with what young people need and what their needs are and, and what, how it is that we can use the various government sectors to advance their interest. And so it's pervasive, and that's why it's important, right? It's important that when you have a government that they are fairly reflective of and representative of the population. Population is a young population. It creates a unique equilibrium, right? It's got 60% or so of our population is below the age of 35. That's, that's the last assessment that we have. It means that you have to have young voices in your cabinet when it comes to the highest decision-making body of the country. When it, when it also means that you are, the country is immensely benefiting as from having a young president. So I have seen how President Irfan Ali's decisions have been directly focusing on young people and seeing that translate into material things. The fact that he is so active, the fact that the entire government is so active is very important because it gives us a good connection with how we make our decisions. You can't make decisions on behalf of people when you don't really understand their issues. The other thing too is that people in the country, they want to work and build. They do, they have a sense of patriotism for, a strong sense of patriotism for our country, whether they're here or any other part in the world. They love Guyana, we love Guyana. And we wanna build the things that we love. When you have children, you wanna work on building your children. When you have a relationship with the person that you love, you wanna work and build your relationship. Same thing with your country. And that's why it's been, it's been a real um, refreshing revelation to see how the, the country and the people of the country have been so enthusiastic about building. Now, on the sports side, we didn't get to cover on the sports side because we've doing, we're doing some really, really special things, first of all. We're doing over the, the Rocket Center, um, which is gonna be done in, in maybe in another few weeks or so. We're doing over the gymnasium, turning it into a real multi-purpose facility. Um, a lot of the community grounds are now going to be enhanced in a very significant way. It's going to be reoriented as well. We're going to, the, the president wants to uh, put lights on 10 grounds, meaning one in every region, right? So that people can have a safe space where they can go in every single part of the region and they can go for leisure activities. The, the country is changing, the population is changing, so the community centers, they also have to change. Not everybody wants to play cricket, not everybody wants to go and look at cricket, so there are gonna be some of those grounds that are gonna be turned into mini parks, so something like the National Park, but on a smaller scale. Um, there are a number of the, the so our big multi-purpose facilities as well, Albion, Mackenzie, Anna Regina, so Region 2, Region 6, and Region 10. Um, those projects are going to be starting now. We just need to sign the, uh, the loan agreement with um, the Chinese government. But those are going to be multi-billion dollar investments. So there's going to be significant changes happening on the sports side. 
Minister, tell me what Region 10, when you say Region 10, Linden, yeah. what can Linden expect from So, our big projects, we have three big projects that are happening um, through our ministry, and it's expected to be completed within the next three years. Once it starts now, we should expect it to be completed within three years. Um, region 10, so in the last five years, Mackenzie Sports Club, which is a stronghold Linden is a region 10, but Linden in particular is a stronghold of the previous administration. Or you can say at this point in time, was. Was, right? At least was. And Mackenzie Sports Club didn't get anything from the previous administration. And they lobbied, insisted, urged, constantly been asking. And in that area, they got no assistance from the previous administration. We're about to put several hundred million dollars, or maybe even more, a billion dollars maybe, into the enhancement of that facility, turn it into big stands, big lights, um, food centers, and things like that. Minister, spending money is not hard. I know to spend a lot of money. I want to know how are the persons in the environs of Mackenzie Sports Club, when the government infuses this money in there, how are they going to benefit? Tell me some of the things that they're going to benefit from. Building gives people an opportunity to work. That's the first thing. Right? Job creation. Job creation. Three years at least. Three for years of size work. Project. Three years of work, but it's not only sports alone, it's not facility alone. The president, when we had our first cabinet outreach, we went to Linden. Linden was the president's first cabinet outreach. The previous administration never even had a cabinet outreach in, in Linden. That is a very powerful point. In that outreach, the president announced that they were going to build 1,000 homes, not house lots only, 1,000 homes in Linden. Do a calculation right now. 1,000, let's say the average home that they're gonna sell for, let's say five billion, I'm sorry, five million to seven million dollars, right? For the, the home that's gonna be sold. That multiply that by a thousand. That's anywhere between five to seven billion dollars of direct investment of work and work opportunities right there in Linden. Five to seven billion dollars. That's starting this year. These are not things that, like what happened in the last administration where people are saying that we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. No, we're about delivery. I've said this multiple times that the previous administration was characterized by being a government of broken promises. We wanna be characterized as a government of fulfilled promises. We want to be characterized by the government of progress. They are now going to be characterized by the group of protest. Minister, um, why, I, why I focus on Linden, or why my focus is on Linden? For too long, the community of Linden, you know, I, I'm, I'm somebody who goes out in the interior lot, I pass through the community of Linden. I know a lot of Lindeners, I have a lot of supporters in Linden. And for too long, they have been sidelined. Can we be assured that no matter what Lindeners' political affiliations are, they are to benefit? I know the president says he's gonna put out thousand house lots. Uh, house lots. Thousand homes. homes. Thousand homes. And, and I many know more also, house lots. You guys are investing in the Mackenzie's playground and the intention is to make it a multi-purpose facility so anybody could go there. They will, nobody would be stopped from going there. And the first thing, unless you're carrying your supporters from Georgetown, mm -hmm. the people who are going to be using this facility are mainly the opposition supporters or were mainly opposition supporters. So Lyndon could look to you as the Minister of Culture, Youth and Sport and expect the best, even more than they would have gotten from their own leaders, 
they can expect that from you now? Well, anything more than zero is more, because that's what they got under the previous administration. They got zero. And you know that's why it's so easy for us to go into any community now. Because, and so even communities that were very harsh to the People's Progressive Party in the, in the previous leading up into like, let's say the 2011, kind of 2015 kind of period, even in those communities where they, it, it would, they weren't as welcoming, now it's easy for us to go in and to, for us to be received very well. Why? Because they were neglected by the last administration. They had all those promises. They should have been supported, but they weren't. And, they, and the people of those communities, they know that. Meanwhile, what we have now is that there's a lot of information coming out showing the wholesale corruptions and the scandals that were going on in the previous administration. They were just enriching themselves. And it just reinforces what we suspected all along, that the reason why there was this desperate attempt to rig the election and hold on to power for five months, broke the Guinness Book, Book of World Records in the world for longest to give up power, they were holding on because they were fat fouling themselves. They were fat fouling themselves, holding on to power so that they could get more for themselves, neglecting everybody else. We we go into Buxton, Buxton, Brickla, places that weren't friendly to the People's Progressive Party before, before 2015. And when we went in there. We, we got a very welcoming reception. When we discovered while we were there, it's because they never did anything for those communities. People like Trevor Ben would have far more persons protesting outside of the breakdown lockups if he did more for people in the country especially people who they claim are supportive of them. They, he would have had far more protests. Minister, I get the sense that, you know, just months in, you're sitting and you, you understand the dynamics of serving the people. Um, months rolling up to the elections, months before rolling up the, to the elections, um, the past administration, or now the opposition, would have acted in a manner that they were delivering. But you got the sense this was a campaign. Um, how have you been able to attain this, this understanding of your need to serve the people more than campaigning? Is it as a result of you seeing the mistakes of the past administration or something that is innate in you to serve? Um. What we saw in the last two years of the previous administration was that they only kicked into high gear uh, after the no confidence motion when they realized that they needed, they knew they were gonna rig the, the election. We knew that they were gonna rig the election. Every single bits of information that we were getting, and the whole country, to be honest, knew that they were gonna rig the election. And they were only trying to do two things. Number one, they were trying to get as close the gap as much as they could so that the rigging doesn't have to be so flagrant. They did that didn't that didn't work, that didn't succeed. The second thing that was happening during that period of time was the wholesale distribution to friend to a few friends and cronies of those political that political group in the in the coalition. That's what they were doing. Meanwhile, nobody else, let's look at House Knox, for example, right? In the entire period that they were sitting in government, they gave out 7,000 House Knox, 7,000 House Knox, right? We do 7,000 House Knox in a year and more, in one single year and more, okay? Think about how foolhardy that is from the point of view of what that could have done 
to their supporters and to the people of the country. When you think that, when you understand that land is first of all wealth, right? Land is intergenerational wealth because you get it, you can pass it on to your children. It's something that your family can build and grow into. It's also capital. So you can use it for, for the realization of capital. You can take a loan on it and go and start a business if you want to. Also another opportunity for real wealth. And they neglected an important area for people's wealth creation in the country. And that's why housing is such an important component for President Ali's vision and the People's Progressive Party's uh, program. It's about wealth creation. We want to make sure that you have intergenerational wealth, building with families and communities. I hear you, Minister. Uh, we covered sport to uh, some extent, of culture, youth. What is your vision? How do you build morale in your ministry? I've noticed. Um, a bit of an advanced drive in your ministry uh, not saying others are lacking but a heightened sense of self um, amongst your, your your teams how do you how can you what knowledge can you impart with those out there maybe business owners and other ministers as to how we can move forward what is the main drive first of all the, the direction I, I get my direction from the president Right? The president is the one that's leading this entire principles and the ethos of our government. The cabinet as well. I, I get a lot of inspiration from our cabinet too because I see them working all the time. I see them out there in, in communities and delivering on their promises, delivering goods and services, working hard every single day, meeting with people. This is probably the best team that this country on a government side, on the cabinet side, it's probably the best team that this government has ever seen. And it's one, one of the things that, that really, I've ne never held a ministerial position before, but I've always had like a satellite position, um, kind of growing up in, in, in the world of politics and government, then also starting to work in the office of the president when I came back from, from England. Um, I, I was maybe 12, 13 years ago, I don't remember exactly, but it's been a long time. Um, I was able to see from a bird's eye view how important that part of doing government in that way as being important. But having now been or now holding the position as a, as a minister and a senior minister in the government, teams are really important to be able to deliver your, your goods and services for people and to be able to develop um, deliver your program that's going to advance people and their welfare. I never really understood that in a very deep way, but it's something that the president, just when he became our presidential candidate, he emphasized team. He emphasized team. And in almost every single cabinet session that we have or any kind of meeting that we have, he emphasizes the principles of team and family. Right? And I see that being replicated throughout our camp. And that's why, even though our, our ministry is fairly aggressive, we, we, I get our inspiration, or my inspiration, and our ministry's inspiration by the direction that we're getting from the energy we're getting from the president and also our cabinet members. This, we're, we're, doing, we're doing very good things. Um, and tomorrow, for example, we're gonna be visiting 12 communities on, along the East Bank and the Suzdak area. Um, we're also going into the Kurukuru Training College because we're, our projects are about to start there. We're also bringing the Board of Industrial Training, I, I forgot to mention the Board of Industrial Training through the Ministry of Labor. Um, we're bringing a component of the delivery of their program to the Kurukuru Training College. Uh, so we've had some very good discussions with um, Minister of, of Labor, Joe Hamilton. And so he and I are going up there tomorrow so that we can put the Board of Industrial Training, uh, we're heavy duty training, right there at the Kurukuru Training College. Um, so we've got about 12 
villages and communities that we're going to be visiting tomorrow. We're doing a lot, but there's a lot that the entire cabinet is doing. And I'm very, very pleased to see this kind of pace and energy and reception, uh, receptiveness to ideas and willingness to work with everyone in the process. So why is it that this, this mantra that is coming out of the opposition that afro Guyanese are being targeted, why is it that it's not taking hold in our society? It's because everyone is seeing that we are governing in a balanced and a fair way. We didn't say we're gonna do the COVID-19 cash grant, we're gonna do it in every region except in Region 10. We started in Region 10. We didn't say we were gonna do Barbies but not give in, in Tiger Bay or in All Boys Town. Every area. So we had so many more persons that were signing on to the COVID-19 cash grant, including the opposition. We have to now go for more money to get to fulfill those demands. So people are seeing that we're not going into only communities that are strongholds of the People's Progressive Party. We're going into all communities. We're not doing work there that are only in the People's Progressive Party stronghold. We're doing it in all the communities. We don't go build roads and in one area and don't do it in another area. We're doing it all over. Minister. The, the COVID-19, sorry, the, the cash grant. Let's use the cash grant as another example. I always wonder why the government who would have seen how important the COVID-19 cash grant was. Sorry, not the COVID-19, the, the school kids cash grant. $10,000 per child. Per child. Yes. It was $1.6 billion. Not a lot, relatively speaking, when you consider how it injects into the economy and what they do with that money because they take that money and they go and spend it immediately and it has more money in circulation, etc. So there's a lot of spin-off benefits for it. The government knew that this was a good program and they didn't continue. They didn't continue it. We're bringing that back now, increasing it to 15,000 and it's gonna go all the way to 50,000 at by within this five year period. I always wondered why they never continued it. But it's because there was no hustle involved. In it. There was no hustle. It was a voucher that the parents used to collect and they, they used to go and use it at, at particular locations. There was no way that they could use that 1.6 billion for any kind of hustle. That benefited people of all races, all races. The, the 15,000 cash grant that we're reinstituting through, re through the Ministry of Education, all families, no matter who you are. Minister, you know, normally, when I do interviews, there one, there's one question that I call pack a punch. Okay. I haven't been doing that recently, but it's gonna come back. Today is <laughs> pack a punch day. Do you think that as a result of what we can label nicely as saying you're straying from the flag. Recently, just before the election, there was a bit ahead of where you yourself uh, wanted to become a presidential candidate. There was a rift there. Do you think as a result of that experience, it has now, because I'm hearing you talking about President, President Ali and his vision, and how you guys are working together to make this government work. Do you think that has had to your experience and has helped you to develop into being a better team player? I didn't think it was a rift. I mean, I think that assumption is not correct. I think when you're competing at that point and you say that you think you, can, you would put us in a better position to win, um, most of the people who put their hands up, that's what they believe. And you've got to believe that when you're competing. However, what was my response immediately after, right? Immediately after was, it's all about the team, right? Regardless of who was leading the team at the time, societies are built by a collective. It's a collective of people. And one of the reasons why human beings as a species has been able to survive 
for 200,000 years is because our individual weaknesses have been compensated by our collective strength. And if you feel that you can accomplish things alone, get caught in the Atlantic Ocean and see where you're gonna go if you don't need people to help you. Get sick and see if you don't need the doctor to assist you. Who taught you when you were at school, right? Who would have done all the work in your community or built your roads for you to travel? All those things are built by teams. It wasn't that I wasn't a team player then, but now do I, in a much more emphasized and much more profound way, understand the importance of team. When I lead a ministry which has got 400 people working for us, multiple departments, absolutely. You, you, I know, and that's one of the things that we do at our ministry is about we try to create a culture where everybody gets an understanding that we're all part of the same team, that we're working towards the same goal. We set a goal that is, that is universal to everyone, that all of our programs have to be working in that direction, moving in that direction. So uh, I didn't, I grew up playing sports. So I was always a, a very, very oriented in a team, team way. But I don't think that we had a rift. I think when you're competing, you're always gonna have, you're always gonna wanna win, I think. Well, now from your perspective, I'm having that understanding. But from the people's perspective, we were seeing a showdown outside here. We were looking on and thinking, whoa, but what happened? this was Bacchanal. But what happened immediately after? <laughs> once, yeah. once the president was elected, once the, the presidential candidate was elected, everybody fell into line. And that's the way that you've got to, that's the way that you've got to understand that your role is part of a team. I'm much more convinced that people who understand that their role is part of a team, I'm much more convinced that that is the only method and the superior method of being able to develop things generally, but much more so for the people that hold positions of leadership. Minister, one of the things that has plagued this country uh, through consecutive administrations is corruption. Mm. Um, now, the budget that your ministry holds and is supposed to spend for 2021 is the largest budget of its kind ever allocated to that ministry. Uh, can you tell me what the Guyanese public, citizens, can expect from you in the event someone within your ministry is found to be participating in corrupt practices? So there's no place for corruption in, in, as far as I'm concerned, from a government standpoint. Um, and we've been, we've been making sure that we're firm on that position. What I've, what I've been trying to, to really get a fairly good handle on is what are our procurement laws requirements. Um, so what you'll see coming out on, I think tomorrow, is the list of all of our tenders for all of our projects. So for all of the public works and the, the capital projects, they all have to go through a tendering process. It's as simple as that. What's also important is the leader of the organization, it's for them to make sure that they file their integrity declaration. The previous administration, they didn't file a single integrity declaration with the Integrity Commission, including the president. So. Those are very key signals for public officials and the way in which you're carrying out your program is that it has to go through a tendering process, it's got to be open, um, that's the best way that you're going to be able to have uh, uh, the best value for money. Now, there's, you're always going to have weaknesses in the system. How is that going to be dealt with by you in the event it's found? I'm hoping that it's never going to be found, right? I'm hoping that the, the, the weakness in the system doesn't, doesn't eventuate into any kind of serious corruption. Um, weaknesses in the system is that you're, you don't always get value for money. That's the, 
the weakness in the system that I'm concerned about. But there's no place for people who are uh, under my leadership, or who are caught in corruption, who are involved in that kind of corruption. Like Minister, I know you got something coming up. You're 10 minutes past the, the 12 o'clock meeting. I want to, I wanna, um, just in short, recently, a member of the PNC left, uh, Lennox Gasper. Yeah. And this is a person who left and has spoke publicly about his dissatisfaction. He was on my program. And I made a commitment, not being a government official, but because of the fact that I know um, this administration would be willing to work with anybody who is in the best interest of the people. I made a commitment to Gasper to see how we can get support for him because he's into sports and these kind of things. Um, even persons who would have left and I mean, I'm talking about party affiliates, because you're already taking care of the opposition supporters. Um, persons such like Lennox Gasper, who has ideas in developing his community in London, can he expect your support? Everyone can expect my support, especially when they understand what's their role in how do we build a country. When an election is over, you get busy building the that's what you get busy with. You don't get busy creating turmoil and conflict in the country. That, that's why I'm, I'm very upset with what the AP and UAFC are doing right now, right? They're continuing to try to sow the seeds of discord in the country. And we're, we're are about, in this country, to enter a period of quite possibly the most prosperity that we would have seen in our country's history and quite possibly ever in our country's future. So, but it will be an extended period. You need to have all hands on deck. When you want to still pursue that senseless narrative that you're doing, that you actually won the election, right, and that we're a fraudulent government, you're not doing this country any good. You're not doing this country any good. When you know that there are a few, maybe about five persons, five persons who have been charged with election rigging or corruption, and you say that that's a targeting of Afro-Guyanese, there's no place for that discussion and narrative in our country. How many persons in the last five years, did the AP and UAFC protest for who were of Afro Guyanese? How many? How many persons who were Afro Guyanese who were held for 72 hours did they protest for? None. Did they ever, if they're really interested in, in uh, political per persecution as they claim it, they're labeled it. Did they protest for Anil Nandalal, who it was alleged that he took books or Irfan Ali uh, at that time, now the president, when he wasn't involved in a land transaction? Where were the protests then? So I'm saying, what, what about when Roger Luncheon, Dr. Roger Luncheon, or Ashley Singh, or Winston Brassington? My wife was chased down. I'll open that up at a, a, another, another day. My wife was chased down. Three persons died. You know what the previous president said about that uh, incident? That that was a legitimate state operation and that there was no need for an investigation. Three Guyanese died. Two, one was a, 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 a soldier, one was a nurse, one was a civilian. Three persons died, Guyanese chasing down my wife as an opposition member. My wife had nothing to do with anything. I wasn't even in the country at the time. They said, the president of the country said back then that it was a legitimate state operation and that there was no need for an investigation. Minister, in closing, is there anything you want to leave Guyanese with um, assurances that you want to leave them with before we close today. I give you that opportunity the, to address the general public. The, the, 
country is at a very important point in terms of how do we transform. Uh, and it's, it's important to understand that once the election is over, and the election is over, that the process has to be led by the government, but that everybody is involved in the process of building, that we must get busy using our effort and energies towards building the country, building the image of the country too. The president and the, the cabinet, it's got a very grand vision for the country. It's got the experience as well as the, the freshness of ideas and, and the methodology of being able to implement the, pro the projects, the programs, and the policies coming out of the government. That's how we should be busy. We should be busy focusing our attention on advancing aggressively nation building and, and the program of the government and also building your own lives. Minister, I want to thank you very much for uh, this interview. It's always nice interacting with you. It's always a positive energy um, from our interactions and I'm hoping we can do this more often and I can tell you the feedback I always do with people who I have an interview with. The feedback from the ground is mostly positive except for the negative that are intentionally created um, and you should I think keep forging ahead in the direction you have chosen and I for the most part Diane is behind and very much in support of you. Thank you once again.